Fifth Sunday of Lent Readings for Year C Hello, I'm Jeff Cavins. Today we're looking at the readings for the fifth Sunday in Lent. The theme that surrounds the readings is that God is doing something new. I don't know about you, but there's been times in my life where I've done things or I've got myself in a rut and I just thought, you know, I need something new in my life. But I know when it comes to my walk with the Lord, there are times where I do get into a rut or I'm caught in sin and I do need something new. In the Gospel of John, we see something very, very powerful, and that is a woman who is caught in adultery, and Jesus sets her free. Indeed, he does something new in her life, and I want to talk about that for just a moment. But the Old Testament reading sets the foundation for this week's reading. In Isaiah chapter 43, Isaiah speaks to Israel at a time when they needed something new. And he says, God is doing something new, but he qualifies that statement by saying, don't dwell on the past. Don't dwell on the past. Remember not the events of the past. God is doing something new. And I think that during Lent, when we're preparing ourselves for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we are taking a look at our own hearts, sometimes we need to let go of the past and let God do that new work in our hearts. As we look at chapter 8 of John, we see that the Pharisees and the scribes brought a woman who was caught in adultery, and they brought her to Jesus, and they threw her down at his feet and said, Jesus, she was caught, and the law says that we should stone her. Jesus responds in sort of an odd way. He bends down on his knee, and he begins to write in the earth. And then he stands up and he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he bends back down to his knee and he writes on the earth once again. As he does this, we notice that the scribes and the Pharisees left one by one, starting with the oldest, leaving the woman completely free with Jesus. In order to understand the context of John chapter 8, where the woman is caught in adultery, we have to go back to chapter 7. And we see in chapter 7 and verse 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this is the day before the woman was caught in adultery and Jesus is at the temple and it's the last day of the great feast, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. And on that last day, there was a great water libation and offering where they would take water and they would pour it out in the temple. And it spoke of a time when the Messiah would come. And when the Messiah comes, water will flow from the temple even out into the desert. But as we read on in chapter 7, we see that not everyone accepted his message. In fact, they rejected his message. We see that there was a group of people that were sent to arrest him that day, and they went back to the authorities empty-handed. So I want you to remember a couple of themes here in order to understand what Jesus is doing with the woman caught in adultery and what he's writing in the earth. We know that it's the great feast. Water is an issue. Jesus said, he who believes in me out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. But there are people that rejected him. The context also involves shame. They're trying to shame the woman. So we have the Feast of Tabernacles, we have living water, a rejection of Jesus, and an attempt to shame the woman. So we go back to John chapter eight and we ask ourselves, so what was Jesus doing? when he bent down and he wrote in the earth. What do you think he was writing? He stood up, he made that claim. He who is without sin cast the first stone, went back and wrote again. Whatever he wrote caused them to disperse. I'd like to suggest to you that he wrote from Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17 is at a time in Israel's history where they were dealing with sin and shame. Now, Jesus' style of teaching is, is both simple, but also very advanced. And oftentimes he would hint back to the Old Testament, either by word or action, as in this case. I believe that he's hinting back. 
He's hinting back as to what is actually happening in this situation in freeing this woman from shame. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah 17 in verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. So what is Jesus writing in the earth? I think he's writing the names of those who are trying to shame the woman. And I think they're from the Sanhedrin because they're written from the oldest to the youngest in record in the temple, and it's from oldest to youngest that they are leaving. But the point is this, Jesus sets us free from shame. He gives us a new beginning. Don't look back at the past. God's doing a new thing in your life as he's freeing you from shame in the midst of Lent. Isaiah chapter 43 verses 16 to 21 God does a new thing a path in the sea and rivers in the wasteland Thus says the Lord who opens a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters who leads out chariots and horsemen a powerful army till they lie prostrate together never to rise snuffed out and quenched like a wick Remember not the events of the past the things of long ago consider not See, I am doing something new. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In the desert I make a way. In the wasteland, rivers. Wild beasts honor me, jackals and ostriches. For I put water in the desert and rivers in the wasteland for my chosen people to drink. The people whom I formed for myself, that they might announce my praise. The Word of the Lord. The Israelites were trapped by the Egyptians on one side and the Red Sea on the other. The Lord parted the waters of the Red Sea and allowed them to cross and thus saved his people from slavery and led them to freedom. The Lord is reminding his people that even the forces of nature present no challenge for him or his plan for salvation. Remember not the events of the past. The things of long ago consider not. God is not going to concentrate on your past problems and failures if you are wise enough to ask his forgiveness. Satan is the one who wants you to look backward and thus relive your faults and failures and encourage you to repeat them. God is always looking forward in the hope of our future salvation. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. 
like the torrents in the southern desert, those that sow in tears shall reap rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Although they go forth weeping, carrying the seed to be sown, they shall come back rejoicing, carrying their sheep. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Psalm 126, verses 1 to 6. The Lord has done great things for us. Oh, how happy we were! A Song of Ascents When the Lord restored the captives of Zion, we thought we were dreaming. Then our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues sang for joy. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Oh, how happy we were! Restore our captives, Lord, like the dry stream beds of the Negrim. Those who sow in tears will reap with cries of joy. Those who go forth weeping, carrying sacks of seed, will return with cries of joy, carrying their bundles sheaves. 15 Psalms chapters 120 to 134 of the book of Psalms begin with the words, A Song of Ascent. What do we mean by a song of ascents? Well, there are a number of meanings. In the temple courtyard, there was a wide stairway that consisted of 15 large semicircular steps that ascended into the inner section of the courtyard. The Levites, whose job it was to accompany the temple service with song and instrumental music, would stand on these steps and sing these 15 psalms. Another view is that these psalms were sung by the Jews who ascended from Babylon to Israel in the times of Ezra the scribe, which would be about the time that this particular psalm was written. Another explanation is that these psalms were sung by Jews as they ascended the mountaintop on which Jerusalem and the temple were located. We were dreaming. After being held captive in Babylon, Cyrus, the Gentile Persian king, allowed the Jews who were willing to return to Jerusalem to worship their God and rebuild their temple. His granting permission to leave must have seemed like a dream to the Jews. On our way to the confessional, don't you feel like a captive to your sins? And when you leave the confessional, doesn't it feel like a dream? You are free of your captivity of sin and restored to friendship with God. Restore the fortunes of Zion prior to captivity. People were living well in Israel. Now they would have to begin again and work hard just to get back to where they were prior to the captivity. Then it was said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. Receiving their freedom so suddenly, and at the hands of a Gentile king, all nations must have agreed that the God of Israel had great power. Those who sow in tears will reap with cries of joy. This means that the people who are suffering in pain and crying due to life's circumstances will find joy when God enters their lives to alleviate their suffering. Philippians chapter 3 verses 8 to 14. I forfeit all in order to find my wealth in Christ. Brothers and sisters, I consider everything as a loss because of the supreme good of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have accepted the loss of all things, and I consider them so much rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, 
not having any righteousness of my own based on the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God, depending on faith to know him and the power of his resurrection, and the sharing of his sufferings by being conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It is not that I have already taken hold of it or have already attained perfect maturity, but I continue my pursuit in hope that I may possess it, since I have indeed been taken possession of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I, for my part, do not consider myself to have taken possession. Just one thing, forgetting what lies behind, but straining forward to what lies ahead, I continue my pursuit toward the goal, the prize of God's upward calling in Christ Jesus. The Word of the Lord. Paul is considering his past life, and he views it as worthless compared to knowing Christ. He recognizes that a person's relationship with Christ is more important than anything else. The closer we are to Christ, the more you consistently model his behavior of love, patience, charity, and mercy. Paul had given up everything in order to follow and bring others to Christ. When you consider Paul's efforts to spread the word of God, they were monumental in human terms. People tried to kill him. He was beaten, imprisoned, and eventually beheaded. Yet all these earthly sufferings were nothing compared to what Paul believed awaited him in heaven. Do you recall how you felt when you fell in love? You did your best to spend as much time as you could with the one you loved. The person was constantly on your mind. You became infatuated and eventually fell into a long-lasting love so intense that you were willing to give up your life for that person. Sounds like the love that Christ has for us, doesn't it? Sounds like the relationship Paul is seeking with Christ, doesn't it? Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Even now, says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, for I am gracious and merciful. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. John chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. The woman caught in adultery. Let the one without sin cast the first stone. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. But early in the morning, he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So, what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, 
he bent down and wrote on the ground. And in response, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin any more. The Gospel of the Lord. The Pharisees and the scribes' intention was to trap Jesus between a rock and a hard place. There is an old saying which says, When you seek revenge, you need to dig two graves, one for your enemy and one for yourself. In more modern terms, what goes around comes around. The Romans had taken away capital punishment from the Jews when the only justification for its use was a violation of Mosaic law. If the Jews imposed a death sentence for violation of Mosaic law, it would have been considered by the Romans as a rebellion. Instigators of a rebellion by Roman law were put to death. If Jesus agreed to stoning, then the Pharisees could accuse him of starting a rebellion, which would have been a capital offense. If he said the Romans have taken away the right to stone her because she only broke Mosaic law, then the Pharisees would say he was a hypocrite because he would be relaxing the law of Moses, which he had accused them of doing in the previous chapter. John chapter 7 verse 19 Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. If Jesus says don't stone her, wouldn't he be selectively enforcing the law? The Pharisees don't view themselves as blind, but as righteous, not as sinners, but as perfect. Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Wow, Pharisees have him. He is authorizing stoning her in violation of the Roman law. But the Romans wouldn't consider the Pharisees as sinless. Therefore, Jesus wouldn't have committed a crime. Jesus didn't authorize the stoning, and if the Pharisees stoned her anyway, they would have committed the act of rebellion and earned capital punishment for themselves. If they don't stone her, then they are admitting that they are sinners. Jesus forced them into a corner. If they insist on their sinlessness by stoning her, then they will die under Roman law. If they walk away, they admit they are sinners without making that confession. The Pharisees and the scribes sought vengeance. They had laid a trap, dug a grave for their enemy. But like the old saying goes, they found themselves standing in the grave they had prepared for Jesus. Early the next morning, he went back to the temple. All the people gathered round him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery, and they made her stand before them all. Teacher! This woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, Moses commanded that such a woman must be stoned to death. Now what do you say? They said this to trap Jesus so that they could accuse him. But he bent over and wrote on the ground with his finger. As they stood there asking him questions, he straightened up. Whichever one of you has committed no sin may throw the first stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground.
When they heard this, they all left, one by one, the older ones first. Jesus was left alone with the woman still standing there. He straightened up. Where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir. Well then, I do not condemn you either. As with most of the readings that we hear in our scriptures today, we must understand the context to fully hear the message as being disseminated by the evangelists. The, especially, especially in St. John. St. John is very careful to note every little detail, and, and he's not being wordy or cute with his writing style but being very precise, very specific, so as to disseminate to his listeners exactly what's going on, and for his listeners to hear very clearly the message that God, as working through him, through the Holy Spirit, seeks to convey. And so, in a particular way, when we read St. John, we shouldn't let any of these details just kind of kind of pass us by. And for instance, in our Gospel today, the very first line is, is, is full of importance. When St. John tells us that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but then early the next morning arrived again to the temple area. Now, we're very familiar with this story about the woman caught in adultery, and uh, very popular. But it's that line that sets the stage, and as a first century Jew, would be profound. As a 21st century Catholic, probably not so profound. Probably because you're all looking at me saying, okay, get to the point, Father. What's so important about it? Ezekiel, Old Testament prophet, prophesied that the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, the glory of the Lord that led the people out of Egypt and the pillar of fire, the cloud, the pillar of smoke, the Shekinah that had settled over the Holy of Holies, the tent, the meeting tent, where Moses had erected the tabernacle in the desert, where the people would come and gather and pray to the Lord. The Shekinah in Hebrew, the presence, the glory of the Lord that came to dwell into the temple that David built and had been dedicated to the Lord under Solomon, his son. The Shekinah, Ezekiel had warned and prophesied, left the temple due to the sin of the people due to the, the hard-heartedness of the Israelites, and it left going east, going over through the Kidron Valley, over the Mount of Olives, out to the east. The glory of the Lord manifested in the Word made flesh, Christ. Leaving the temple area to the Mount of Olives, the Shekinah, the glory of the Lord, but on the next day, returning coming back, not abandoning his people. Very evocative of our first reading today from Isaiah. Isaiah writing to the Babylonian captives, saying, do you really believe that God has abandoned us? Are you that short-sighted in your memory? He who opened the seas, parted the Red Sea so that our ancestors could escape Egypt to freedom? He who left us that, that man in the desert, that pillar of fire, that, that guide to lead and guide us for 40 years and protect and sustain us. That now, all of a sudden, here in Babylon, he's going to forget about us. That all of a sudden, he's just going to leave us to die. And so, this profound opening statement by St. John should not be missed. Should not just be overlooked as some kind of mere geographical reference of minor or insignificance. 
The glory of the Lord, the Lord's Son, the Son of the Father, comes triumphantly from the east over the Mount of Olives, through the Kidron Valley, back into the temple, into the house of the Lord, and sets up the stage for our story today that we know so well. But the glory of the Lord returns to the temple, and the story, therefore, is a juxtaposition of the temple with God's mercy in the person of God himself versus those seeking to enact God's laws, enact God's justice, as it were, without God's mercy, God's glory, the Shekinah. And it's really too for us to call to ourselves, to examine ourselves and how we follow God's law. Appropriately as intended, as, as designed for us in God's own image and likeness, or corrupted, seeking power, seeking authority, seeking some kind of earthly influence or, or, or direction. And so with that background, it's fitting, therefore, to, to look at this story and what's going on. We first see the woman caught in the act. This should catch our attention as well. She was set up. You don't just catch somebody in the act of adultery, unless you're a party to it. Or there's some, especially in this case, there's a whole crowd that is involved in this. A whole crowd has has brought her, pulled her out into the street. It's not as if her husband caught her in the act of adultery. It's not as if one person found her and it's a debate among her and this person. It's this whole crowd of elders. They set her up. Not to condone the act by any means, but she is being made an example of. Dragged out into the street. Again, using the law of the Lord to embarrass the woman, to exact righteous judgment upon her, but also in confronting Christ, what do you say to try to embarrass him, to make an example of him? For Christ, they know, using the power, using the law, that they put Christ in an impossible position. He can't answer yes or no. If he says yes, they should stone her. He contradicts everything he's preached about, about God's mercy, about the, the compassion of, of the Lord. If he, preaches, if he says no, then he directly violates the law of Moses. And so they've set up an impossible scenario. And then Christ writes on the ground. Many, many fathers of the church and scripture theologians and saints throughout the ages have contemplated this. But this is the only time in all of scripture that we have any, any uh, historical uh, reference to Christ writing anything. But we, didn't know, we don't know what he wrote. In fact, the Hebrew word, or the, the Greek word, is more like scribble, doodle. He was kind of doodling. Now, St. Augustine surmised that he was making a list of the sins of the accusers, which makes the story pretty profound. Now, we don't really know. Again, it's his opinion, but I think it's something to contemplate. And as he doodles, he looks up and says, Let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And if he is writing their sins and saying, whatever, Joe, you did this, Pete, you did this, or I don't know, I guess Hebrew names would be more appropriate. <laughs> they are cut to the heart. They're, they're, they realize they've been had. This trap that they've laid for Christ has all of a sudden turned on them. And they go away. Because they remember Daniel. Again, uh, not this year. This is a different cycle, year A. But in year B of the Lenten readings this upcoming week, we would hear the great uh, story of Susanna in the book of Daniel. I urge you all to read it. If you want to learn about the punishment for lying, if you lie before the elders, lie before God in the Old Testament, and another person is convicted because of your lie, and the lie is found out, you gain the punishment that was intended for the person who you lied about, who you perjured yourself for. And so, in the story of Susanna, Susanna is wrongly accused of adultery, the figure, and these two old men tried to condemn her in, her in their wickedness to save their own stature in society, and in doing so, Daniel tricks them into condemning themselves and separating them and kind of being a lawyer uh, and it tricks them into uh, perjuring themselves. Not tricking them, but really the truth prevailing, the truth coming out in their lie. And then the two men who had sought to stone that woman, Susanna, and kill her themselves were killed. So these men 
here know this story of Susanna and know the law very well because they're trying to use it to kill this woman, realize that Christ is no dummy. He knows the law. He wrote the law. And he's turned it back on them. Who of you, without sin, be the first to cast the stone? But what he doesn't say, what's implied is, woe to you. He throws the first stone, but has sin on your soul. And, and implying, for even I, even our God and Father Almighty, cannot save you from the punishment, the wrath that will, you will incur. And so they realize this and they turn and go home. And so Christ turns to the woman and says, Where have they gone? Has no one condemned you? Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, do not sin anymore. The temple is and has and always will be an open place of God's mercy. And as Christ has established, as he tore the curtain veil on Good Friday, as he tore the curtain to the, the, the separating the Holy of Holies, separating us from God's majesty, from that Shekinah, the glory of the Lord, as it came to dwell within us, as we too, as we now presently are the temples of the Holy Spirit, that the temple is not a building in Jerusalem, but the temple is our bodies, that that gift, that presence of God's mercy flows through us all, is in all of us, and that we are not to be deceitful and cunning usurpers of the law, but to be acting with the merciful heart of Christ always. So it begs the question, you've heard it a lot this year, it's a whole year of mercy. What is mercy? There are many de definitions, and not ignoring any of them or turning a blind eye to, to, to some of them, we can simplify it and look at our gospel today and, and to recognize that mercy is, in our own lives, acknowledging our wrongdoing, looking at the woman Acknowledging our sinfulness, owning it, making repentance, and committing to turn away. And it's in that act of owning our sinfulness that we are absolutely forgiven by our loving God. A loving God who takes away all of our sin. But in addition, God calls us to be merciful as our Father is merciful. To have the same loving, sincere heart of our Father in heaven and to be able to forgive unconditionally as well. To be able, as we say in the Our Father, to forgive so as to be forgiven. That's what mercy is. To be able to utter the words as Christ says, Neither do I condemn. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Mercy is accepting our brokenness, recognizing it, owning it, and giving it to the Lord. It's not pretending it's not there like these wicked men trying to con, con their way into uh, passing judgment on others, but it's looking introspectively at ourselves, recognizing our failings, and giving it over to the Lord, and going. Going with the Lord in holiness, going with His glory, going with that Shekinah, the glory of the Lord, penetrating our hearts, our minds, our souls, freed from that brokenness, that evil. As St. Paul wrote so beautifully to the Philippians today, to, to be able to go as if the whole rest of the world is but rubbish around us, to gain Christ. That's all that matters. To be able to gain Christ in our life and take possession and be possessed by Him. For He indeed is our goal. Welcome to Holy Here's Sunday Gospel video. I'm Therese, one of your guides. This Sunday Gospel is in John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, but early in the morning he arrived again in the temple area, and all the people started coming to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and made her stand in the middle. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him, so that they could have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and began to write on the ground with his finger. But when they continued asking him, he straightened up and said to them, let the one among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. 
Again he bent down and wrote on the ground, and in response they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. So he was left alone with the woman before him. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She replied, No one, sir. Then Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on do not sin any more. The scribes and Pharisees bring Jesus, a sinful woman, to see what he will do to her. Jesus forgives her and tells her to stop sinning. This is the only time we hear of Jesus writing anything. He wrote something in the sand. And although we don't know what he wrote, it seemed to have been something to convince the scribes and the Pharisees to walk away. Some people think he wrote down the sins of the people who were there. What do you think he wrote? Is there anyone you need to forgive? Try showing kindness and mercy to them just as Jesus did to the woman in the gospel. Bye, see you next time. Scribes and the Pharisees should get credit for honesty. After all, in the case of the woman caught in adultery, they could have made believe they were virtuous and started throwing stones. Instead, when Jesus said, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. As we get older, we have more experience of our weakness. So perhaps the oldest realized soonest that they were not sinless. Their honesty and courage in admitting they were little different from the woman gave courage to their juniors to be as honest. So three cheers for the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus, on the other hand, is something of a disappointment. There are many things he could have done but did not do. Is doodling in the dirt what we want him to do when a woman's life is in danger? Why didn't he try to rescue her? How did the poor woman feel when he entrusted her fate to a mob of religious fanatics? Then, after the mob melted away, where was Jesus the teacher? After all, the woman had been caught in serious sin. Was it right to just say, run along now, and by the way, try not to do it again? Faced with the sin of the woman and the self-righteous violent inclinations of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus seems rather too nonchalant. The English Jesuit priest poet Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote a sonnet that begins, My own heart let me have more pity on, let me live to my sad self hereafter kind. Hopkins apparently treated his own heart much as the scribes and Pharisees treated the woman, rigorous, demanding, and unforgiving. At least some of the time we all do that. I am my own strictest judge. I look on my sins and refuse to temper my judgment with mercy. Much of my reflection on my life as a Christian consists of enumerating my faults and then either feeling miserable about them or feeling miserable that I don't feel miserable about them. But if we concentrate solely upon our sins or the sins of others, we are in danger of becoming so self-absorbed that we will be unable to notice, let alone accept, the loving, forgiving embrace of God. We must leave room for comfort to put down roots. In Lent, it's easy to become obsessed with my sinfulness. After all, it is a season of penitential reflection. I'm supposed to engage in at least some ascetic practice. The season lends itself to concentrating upon my weakness. Perhaps that is why, as we near the end of Lent, we take a look at Jesus refusing to get excited about sin. He does not say it is all right to sin. When the crowd pushes the woman forward, he does not deny her sinfulness. His attitude seems to be, so she's a sinner. Who isn't? If any of you aren't, then do what you wish with her. Of course, there was not one of them who was not a sinner. There is not one of us who is not a sinner. 
That is not, however, the most important thing about us. Sin is serious, but the most important thing in the world is the love of God that forgives our sins. The scribes and Pharisees had forgotten that. So, Jesus says that we have to see sin in the proper perspective. He refused to get excited about the woman's sin. Instead, he accepted her sinfulness, and that of the scribes and Pharisees, as a normal part of life. He told her to avoid it, but did not let her sin become the sole description of her existence. Does that mean that we need not avoid sin? No. I am a child of God, therefore there is a certain kind of life that I should live if I am to be true to who I really am. Like the scribes and Pharisees, I should be brave and honest enough to admit that I am a sinner. Then, like the woman going on her way after meeting Jesus, I should get on with my life as a beloved child, a forgiven child of God. Hi. Many viewers of this Gospel Reflection Series have asked for a text version. So, UCANews.com, in cooperation with ATF Asia, is publishing the complete series in four volumes called In Season and Out. The volume covering year C of the liturgical cycle is now available. Please see the UCANews.com homepage for information about ordering your copy. This is a homily for the fifth Sunday of Lent. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. Let's review our Lenten journey so far. On week 1, the desert. On week 2, the mountain. On week 3, the barren fig tree. On week 4, the parable of the father and his two sons. And on this Sunday, the story of the woman caught in adultery. We find this story in the Gospel of St. John, but the overwhelming consensus among New Testament scholars is that the story of the woman caught in adultery was not originally part of St. John's Gospel. It's not found in the earliest and the best manuscripts of John's Gospel. In other words, it was inserted at a later date. Some ancient manuscripts place the story in St. Luke's Gospel, and it has to be said that stylistically, the tone, content and language of the story are more characteristic of Luke's Gospel. However, there is no reason to doubt the story's authenticity, even if it's not clear exactly where it belongs. It is included in John's Gospel in the Vulgate. The Vulgate is the translation of the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, and that translation was largely the work of St. Jerome in the late 4th century. One of the most prominent biblical scholars of the 20th century, the American Father Raymond Brown, writes that no apology is needed for this once independent story which has found its way into the fourth gospel and into some manuscripts of Luke, because in quality and beauty it's worthy of either John or Luke's gospel. Brown writes, Its succinct expression of the mercy of Jesus is as delicate as anything in Luke. Its portrayal of Jesus as the serene judge has all the majesty that we would expect of John. So in this story, we have a sequence of three dramatic moments. Firstly, the scribes and Pharisees bring the woman before Jesus and lay their accusation. Secondly, we have the exchange between Jesus and the accusers. And finally, the exchange between Jesus and the woman. Now, the story is set in the outer court of the temple. 
That was a very public place. Students frequently gathered there around their favourite scribes to be instructed in the observance of the law. This was a perfect setting if you wanted a large audience, which is what the scribes and Pharisees obviously wanted. This was the perfect place to make a fool of Jesus. So the scribes and the Pharisees bring a woman before Jesus who was caught in the very act of adultery. For the scribes and Pharisees, the main point is not to get the woman punished, but to set a trap for Jesus. She is simply a pawn in their scheme. We can only imagine the woman's state of fear, shock and shame as she's dragged through the streets into the temple precincts where Jesus is teaching. She may well have been scantily clad, as this portrayal of the scene suggests. Mel Gibson's 2004 movie, The Passion of the Christ, left people with the impression that the woman caught in adultery was Mary Magdalene, because both roles in the movie were played by the actress Monica Bellucci. Now, the Gospel does not name the woman, and there are absolutely no grounds whatsoever in the New Testament for identifying the woman with Mary Magdalene. Mary could well sue Mel Gibson for defamation. The Torah is very specific about the death penalty for adultery. In Leviticus we read, the man who commits adultery with his neighbour's wife will be put to death, he and the woman. And in the book of Deuteronomy we read, if a man is caught having sexual intercourse with another man's wife, both must be put to death, the man who has slept with her and the woman herself. You must banish this evil from Israel. So the woman is brought before Jesus by the scribes and Pharisees, and they seek to test him. Master, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. And Moses has ordered us in the law to condemn women like this to death by stoning. What have you to say? Now Jesus is confronted with a dilemma. There is no doubt about her guilt. But if he were to say, release her, let her go, the scribes and Pharisees would accuse him of violating the Mosaic law. The law means nothing to you. If on the other hand, he were to say, stone her, how could he ever again speak of the love mercy and forgiveness of God. Jesus would also be in trouble with the Roman authorities because the Jews were not allowed to impose the death penalty. Jesus says nothing. He bends down and starts writing on the ground with his finger. What did Jesus write? Well, if you're studying scripture and you're looking for a topic for your PhD thesis, here it is. As you might imagine, there has been endless speculation across the centuries. What did Jesus write? Was he just doodling in the sand? A way of saying, I'm not falling into this trap you're setting for me. I'm not getting caught up in the web you're spinning. I'm not playing your game. A tradition that goes back to St. Jerome suggests that he wrote the sins of the accusers. Another suggestion is that he wrote a question. Where is the man? After all, if she was caught in the very act of committing adultery, those who apprehended the woman could just as easily have apprehended the man. The books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy both make it quite clear that both the man and the woman must be put to death. Why was the man allowed to escape? Why wasn't he also brought before Jesus? But we have to admit, we don't know what Jesus wrote. 
Well, we've heard how Jesus dealt with the situation. He says to the scribes and Pharisees, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And one by one they leave, beginning with the eldest. In a society governed by issues of honour and shame, they realise that Jesus has outwitted them. Jesus has a better way of dealing with sin than condemnation and punishment. He doesn't deny or condone sin. His entire concern is to rescue the woman from her terrible plight and to offer her the possibility of a new life. Go, and from now on, sin no more. This is a lesson we are slow to learn. Sadly, the religious instinct is much more prone to condemn and punish rather than to rescue and set on the path of life. From the Verba Seniorum, the saying of the Desert Fathers, we have the story of Abba Sisuez. A monk came to him, expressing great anger at a brother who had hurt him, and wanting revenge. I want to get back at my brother who has hurt me. Do not do that, my son. Leave the matter in God's hands. I will not rest until I get my own back. And in the presence of this monk, Abba Sisuez prayed, O oh God, we have no further need of you, because we have decided to deliver justice ourselves. Forgive me, Abba, said the other monk. I no longer seek to take revenge on my brother. Because when we decide to deliver justice ourselves, we are so often mistaken. And that is why St. Paul reminds us there must be no passing of premature judgment. Leave that until the Lord comes. Reconciliation was one of the themes in the pontificate of Pope St. John Paul II. So, for example, on July the 6th, 1415, the Czech priest John Hus was burnt at the stake for heresy. In 1999, Pope John Paul said, I feel obliged to express deep regret for the cruel death inflicted on John Hus and the resulting wound, a source of conflict and division, which was thus opened in the minds and hearts of the Bohemian people. In the year following his election, Pope John Paul called for theologians, scholars and historians to re-examine Galileo's case. We cannot deny, the Pope said, that Galileo suffered greatly at the hands of churchmen. The religious instinct, sadly, is so much more prone to condemn and punish rather than to rescue and set on the path of life. I dreamt death came the other night, and heaven's gate swung wide. With kindly grace an angel ushered me inside. And there, to my astonishment, stood folks I'd known on earth. Some I judged and labelled, unfit, of little worth. Indignant words rose to my lips, but never were set free, for every face showed stunned surprise. Not one expected me. I never make mistakes. Have you ever read that one saying that seems to perfectly sum up your life? Someone sent me an email with various sayings on it, and this one stood out above all the rest as applying to my life. I read it simply, I never make mistakes. Yes, it was meant in a humorous way, but that saying, as typed, is perfect for my life, 
because it shows my inability to get some things right no matter how hard I try or how simple they seem to be. It goes beyond mistakes in spelling and grammar you often find in my writings. I have trouble getting things right in almost every area of my life. I remember one of the situations from an old television comedy, The Odd Couple. In this particular scene that I remember, Oscar had a gambling problem. He had lost most of his money to a friend in a friendly game of cards. The friend really didn't want the money. He wanted to help Oscar. So he told Oscar he would give him a chance to win all the money back. The friend said, I'll bet you all of your money that you can't type your name correctly in 10 seconds. Oscar was smiling from ear to ear. He was a professional writer and had typed his name thousands of times. Oscar sits down in front of the typewriter and tries to type his name and fails to get it right. His friend offers him another chance and he blows it again. Then another chance and he still can't get it right. You see, that's me. I'm Oscar in that story. Like you, I try. I really do try to do things in the best possible way. However, sometimes no matter how much I try, I just can't do it. Each morning I pray that God will lead me and give me the wisdom to recognize his leadings. I pray that he will give me wisdom to make the right decisions in my daily life and in areas where my life touches the lives of others. The truth is that I do make mistakes. In fact, it seems that if you or I were keeping count, I would have more mistakes than positive successes. You may be like me, but I hope you do a better job at life than I do. If you're like me, you may be wondering, what's the use? Why even try? I make mistakes. I say the wrong things. I do the wrong things. I have the wrong thoughts. I tend to keep count of those things in my own heart. In John 8, 1 to 8, we see an adulteress brought to Jesus for his judgment. Did you notice that Jesus didn't condemn anyone, not even the Pharisees or the scribes, who sought to trap him? Now that's real charity, real love. In the end, Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and do not sin again. Remember this story when you open the door to the confessional. You will enter, tell your sins, and through the absolution of the priest, acting in the person of Christ, you will leave with the same words on your mind as those offered to the adulteress. Neither do I condemn you. Go, and do not sin again. Yes, you will sin, but you can always return to the endless stream of grace flowing from the Lord's mercy, compassion, and forgiveness.